Welcome to the podcast From the Alps to the Rockies. It's part of the celebration of 75 years of diplomatic relations between Switzerland and Canada. The Swiss Embassy in Ottawa and the Consulates General in Montreal and Vancouver are pleased to offer you a series of podcasts between July 1st and August 1st, the respective national days of the two countries. The broadcasts will feature speakers from Switzerland and Canada who will discuss various aspects of collaboration from the Swiss Alps to the Canadian Rockies. Welcome to this edition of the podcast from the Swiss Alps to the Canadian Rockies. My name is Urs Obrist. I'm the Senior Science and Technology Councillor at the Embassy of Switzerland in Ottawa. Today's topic is of relevance, literally, for both the Swiss Alps and the Canadian Rockies, as we will discuss Swiss and Canadian activities in Arctic research. Climate change is affecting the Arctic and Antarctic regions as much as it impacts mountain ranges such as the Alps and the Rocky Mountains. It is my great pleasure to welcome two experts in the field with a wide-ranging history of research activities in the North and in the Alps. First off, uh, Konrad Steffen. Konrad Steffen has been the scientific director of the Swiss Polar Institute for the past eight years and is also the director of the Swiss Federal Research Institute, WSL. His list of publications is very impressive and he serves on various international committees of high relevance and editorial boards as well. Our second speaker is Stefan Gruber, who is professor at the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Carleton University in Ottawa. He holds the position of Canada Research Chair for Climate Impacts Adaptation in Northern Canada since 2013. His connection with Switzerland is through his studies at the University of Zurich, where he earned his PhD in Natural Sciences in 2005 and worked as senior researcher and lecturer. So to start this off, I would like to ask you, Stefan, about your way to make it all the way from the Alps to the Rockies, or at least from the University of Zurich to Carleton University in Canada. Well, if you're a permafrost researcher, then really having a job in countries without permafrost isn't, isn't such a good option. And among the countries with permafrost, um, Canada is very attractive. It has a lot of permafrost, it has a lot of wilderness areas, and it's a place where you can really have an impact with your research. And then at the time, um, there was the Canada Research Chair advertised that I now hold, which was a great opportunity. But also, when you think about your career in the long term, you think about, is this a place where I would like my family to live? You know, can I see my children grow up here? It's not all about research and career. And so where I am now at Carleton University in Ottawa is something that speaks to me because I don't really like cities. And I can live, and this is where I speak with you now, in the forest on the Quebec side of the river. But I have the luxury of also working at a university in Canada's capital. And that was, that was a very good combination of um, being a great step for research and a nice place to be living with my family. Okay, that's a great start. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe just adding on to that, the question after your experience in Switzerland, what kind of Swiss qualities or Swissness uh, can you bring into your job uh, here in Canada? W what kind of lessons from Switzerland can you apply? As you know, I'm German. Yes. Yeah. So as you know, I'm German and I've, I've lived in Switzerland for 12 years. I'm married to a Swiss woman. I have two children who were born in, in Zurich. And then since graduating high school, I've, I've worked or lived in five or six more countries other than, you know, Germany, Switzerland and Canada. And every time you take something with you, you know, habits, something you learn, some preferences. And if you were to ask my colleagues here at university, these things I bring, they would probably not be able to distinguish between it being German or Swiss. But if, if, if I were to answer this, I think it pertains to how you frame quality, right? So I think uh, my way of framing quality, and I think this is why I like Switzerland and I like to work in Switzerland and work with Swiss people, is that the aspirations you have for quality are like, it has to be the best, not just merely good enough. And sometimes that can drive yourself and other people nuts. And it also has to who do I want to work with? What tools do I want to use? And I have to say that I've been spoiled by working in Switzerland, right? If you are a researcher in Zurich, you have the best of everything within reach. 
right? And if it's not in Zurich, then it's a short train ride away somewhere else in the country. And um, I think just being used to being able to reach out or include top of line in their field and say, hey, you have time for a coffee? I would like to discuss something with you, right? And that's, I think this is something that the closeness to like the top of the field in almost everything, is something that I've brought with me. Thank you. And I think that's a great point to connect with uh, Connor Stefan as well. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Stefan, the, the point of quality of research. And uh, Connor Stefan uh, is director of the Swiss Polar Institute and the WSL in Davos, which is part of the ETH board. ETH Zurich is one of the leading uh, universities in the world, if I may say so. And so uh, the aspect of quality certainly uh, characterizes your work as well, Conrad. If I may ask you a little bit about course, your like background um, and the connection with Canada. Of course, thank you that I can participate in this very nice anniversary podcast. Uh, my background with Canada goes back to my field season in the Canadian Arctic. My professor was also a research professor at McGill University in Canada and a professor at ETH. I was a student there. I studied first electrical engineering and then I went to earth science. And he had an ongoing project on X Liber, the island in Canada. And it was in 1967. It was 44 years ago. I went first to a field season. And when we went to a field season, we were dropped by the professor in a small plane on the island, sometimes in spring. And he said, OK, I'm coming back in five months. Make sure you get all the data in your field books. We had no computers. Make good notes. And then we analyzed the data set. That was my master's thesis. I actually studied on a tundra. And that was the year I really got hooked with the Arctic. And I can say for the last 44 years, I have gone back to the Arctic every year. And even this year, I hope to go back to the Arctic in August. I already booked the flights for the research. And conducting research expeditions to look at the interface climate and ice. When you say you, you worked in the Arctic, may, maybe specifically with regards to Canada, what kind of Canadian qualities when it comes to research would you like to see in Switzerland? Because Canada obviously has a very strong research excellence in the field of polar research as well. When I think about Canada, and now let's go first, what I do really like with Canada. Canada is for me a pioneering nation. It's open, it's really welcoming everybody everywhere. And that was the attitude, what I really liked. Not that the Swiss are not less welcome, but they're much more closed. I mean, as in Canada, they invite you before you even arrive in the town. That's quite a different attitude. That's what I call a pioneering attitude, which I always liked and I continue to like. This has not changed. That was maybe also one of the reasons I emigrated to Colorado in the U.S. in 80, 1986, where I stayed for more than 30 years for the Colorado to do research. Now, your question about the research connection with Canada. If you look at mid-latitudes, we see the impact not as vividly. And we look in the Arctic, you have a two to three times increase in temperature due to the albedo feedback. That means snow is removed, the sun gets absorbed at the surface, you heat the air much more. This is for me a test bed to see how climate change impacts environment, society, even when you go, that's what you have to learn, what is coming from mid latitude. So it is the best place to study climate change, to go north, either Canadian Arctic, unfortunately Switzerland has no Arctic, so I have still to go to Canada or to Greenland, or you go to high elevation. What you also mentioned, the third pole, and that's why the metaphor of melting glaciers is also a metaphor of a warming climate. Good, thank you. Uh, do, do you have specific research projects uh, in line uh, right now? The Swiss Polar Institute uh, is known. Uh, it's fairly recent institutions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Swiss Polar Institute and their activities and connections with Canada? We actually have a, an agreement, an MOU, and I'm sure you remember because you were part of signing that a few years ago. And that MOU is actually open that we exchange 
research ideas, but more importantly, researchers and students. Mm -hmm. And right now I have funding that we can support young scientists. And we call them the Access Grant. We got some support by a French bank that supports young scientists up to 50,000 per year per person to go to do research in the Arctic within a group. Because young scientists usually don't have the connection yet. And that actually opens the door to a lot of researchers in Switzerland, but hopefully also for the Canadian research to collaborate on different fields. I say hopefully we have not started to send people to Canada, but I'm currently in contact with several professors at Laval, at McGill, at different places also. And we want to collaborate to exchange the students to spend uh, not a semester, but the field season for now is much better. I welcome that because I think that's part of an education. And we should actually start, and I'm working on that through my connection at ETH, where I'm also teaching, that we make it mandatory for people to go one semester abroad, that actually work at the different locations. And in my view, all my students then most likely would go for a a country that has access to a polar area and what better place there is than Canada. I think a, a lot of Canadians will be very happy to hear about this opportunity to collaborate with Switzerland. Um, I certainly agree the, the opportunity for young researchers and young students to spend an exchange here abroad and specifically in Switzerland or in Canada, vice versa, um, is a fantastic opportunity to be taken off. So. I think I'm okay to refer them to the Swiss Polar Institute if uh, young Canadians are interested in this program. Is that correct? You have programs, even at VFL, you can apply for a fellowship that's independent on age. We pay your stay in Switzerland for up to one year. That means we pay the lodging, we pay the travel costs, we pay the food for you and the family. It's not just a single person because we want to collaborate with international people on the topic. And VSL, my institute, is doing terrestrial environmental science. So you can connect 500 permanent employees and 200 grad students. People, I'm sure you find the topic. Okay, very great. Thank you very much for this uh, point. And um, I'm sure we at the embassy here in Canada, in Ottawa, are, are happy to promote that program as well. Uh, going over to you, uh, Stefan, maybe if you want to speak more in detail about your uh, specific research projects that are ongoing, new research that are in line. So we've, we've started in late 2016 to think about a national scale permafrost research network in recognition that you know, some of the larger questions that we should address weren't easily addressed with like individual scattered projects. And we, we, we took quite some time to bring together a, a large group of people, not only from academia, but government scientists in the federal government and the territorial governments in the north. We included indigenous governments, we included industry, and we had a series of workshops and work towards, it's now been funded last year, it's called NSERC Permafrost Net, so NSERC is the equivalent to the Swiss um, National Science Foundation. And so they funded this for five years now, 11 different universities, 16 professors, about 60 people being trained with a very strong participation of Northern partners. And so we're looking at how can we prepare Canada for permafrost thaw, right? So we know that about 40% of the country has permafrost in the subsurface. And um, we're trying to go beyond individual sites and think about, you know, how can we predict the locations between the sites? what is going to happen in the future, and to make that really serve the needs of the people in the North who's, who live on permafrost. Because what we think as scientists often as being the important questions may not always turn out to be the questions of immediate societal relevance for the people actually living on permafrost. And so that's, that large project has been an incredible journey, I have to say, on, on a personal and scientific level in terms of finding priorities. Search projects within that that measure permafrost in the field and see how we can improve our modeling of that driven with climate data. 
Mm -hmm. And you point out an important aspect, uh, the relevance for society. It's not the pure natural science environment that you work in. There's people involved. Uh, society is impacted. Uh, one of the keywords here probably is migration. People who are forced to move uh, because of climate change, uh, certainly up north in the polar regions, but also in the Alps, that, that could become an issue. Challenges with uh, avalanches. Maybe there's one one important thing to note here from a Canadian perspective on the on the term forced migration, right? So if you if you look at the IPCC context, for instance, in adapting to climate change, there's a trade-off. You know, can we can we adapt enough to stay at a certain location, or do we need to think about moving somewhere else, right? So that that seems to make sense. But there is an added layer of sensitivity in Canada because in the past, fully relocated indigenous peoples in the north. So that is a point that needs much more sensitivity to speak about in Canada, because you don't want to end up in a place where someone from the south, maybe even someone like me coming from Europe, working at a southern university, then goes to the north, you know, as the know-it-all and says, well, I think you should be relocated, right? So it, it's a more sensitive topic here for a good reason. Good. That is certainly a highly relevant uh, point. Um, yeah, maybe just over to you, Connie, in, in Switzerland, what, what is the situation there? Do we have people in Alpine valleys who are so much impacted by climate change that they have to consider moving away? We do have a lot of people living in valleys, in remote valleys, where in a warming climate, there is natural hazard. Part of it is that the avalanche runouts are much longer because the snow is heavier. We will get more accumulation, more snow in a warmer climate, which is heavier at rockfall. And Stefan knows that very well. If you start to melt permafrost, that releases by gravity also bigger pieces of rock or entire areas of a slope. So this will impact Switzerland heavily. And the other problem is to our forests. Forest is a natural barrier for avalanche for a lot of it. But exactly these forested areas are under threat in a warming climate because the trees cannot adapt that quickly to the changing climate, to the warming. And eventually they will be replaced. But you know how long it takes to grow a new forest, even a new species of a tree. So meanwhile, you might actually lose a lot of the protection in the Swiss mountains to protect infrastructure. And we have a lot of infrastructure not just villages, but roads, train systems, and that will be an ongoing challenge. Therefore, we just founded this new research center for climate impact in Alpine region. This is certainly a very interesting topic. Uh, we here at the embassy have been in conversation with the Canadian Mountain Network, which is also looking at questions of biodiversity. Uh, you mentioned the role of the forests, obviously, in mountainous areas. So who knows, maybe there, there's potential to collaborate there in, in that field as well. We are slowly heading towards the end of the conversation. We still have some minutes left. Um, I was wondering maybe if you, Connie, would like to say a little bit more about uh, Switzerland's role in the Arctic Council. Switzerland has had a campaign to join the Arctic Council, uh, which led to a successful membership in 2017 as an observer state. Um, can you briefly describe what is Switzerland's role in the Arctic Council, where Canada is one of the eight leading members? Yes, and I'm very glad you give me the opportunity because we are proud to be an observer on an observer status. So Switzerland is not at the Arctic Council table. We are on the row two or three behind the main dealers of the Arctic Council, which of course is correct, but we have are very much interested. And the reason for it is you research in the Alps, you can research and apply in polar regions as well. But Switzerland has always been known to be a good diplomatic core. And I'm sure I talk in your language, yours. That is one of the strengths of Switzerland to connect nations. And one of the reasons why the Foreign Office contacted me early on, that they more said, we like to be part of that round table so we can help discussing and help giving directives and for new agreements, and that is certainly an important part Switzerland is playing in the Arctic Council. Certainly, we as researchers 
are now challenged to actually step up to the request that we become more active. We actually have several working groups. We are chairing. We actually support through the Arctic. From that part, we have always worked very internationally. But now also our foreign office gets more active in sending people to these Arctic Council meetings. And for us, that's very important that connects us to Arctic nations such as Canada or the U.S. or the Swedes, the Danes and the Russians. And this is certainly also geopolitically interesting. Uh, I mean, we talk about the 75 years of Swiss-Canadian relations uh, on a diplomatic level. Uh, historically, diplomacy often has been focused on economics, uh, culture maybe, and, and science has, has taken on a much more significant role in, in years past and probably will in, in the years to come as well. I think the point you're making is certainly that within the area of uh, polar research, Arctic research, glaciology and permafrost research, uh, there's a lot of potential for Switzerland to be involved and collaborate uh, with Canada. Maybe from your perspective, I don't know, uh, Stefan, if you have any direct link uh, with Arctic Council work, you you have been part of the IPCC. Do you have any other comments or observations to make? In a way, this almost you know makes a bridge to what we talked about earlier. So you know, what are the Swiss qualities one would approach, right? And it's 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 long term thinking. It's it's trying to make progress through partnerships rather than you know framing collaboration as a zero sum game that's preconditioned on I win because you lose. And I really think that Switzerland has a reputation and a track record of, of playing that role well. And I think being an observer on the Arctic Council, as the Arctic change with new pressures with respect to environmental protection, with respect to trade and shipping, um, it is good to have that voice on the table, I think, to look at the long term and, and, and proceed in a balanced way. So I, I think that's a very good thing. Mm -hmm. Good. I, I think that's a very nice uh, concluding word. I think with that, I would like to thank you both for taking the time and be part of this uh, podcast. I hope your research in the North will be fruitful and beneficial in, in the days ahead. And I look forward to seeing you at one point or another back here in Ottawa uh, for an actual direct contact. So with that, uh, thank you very much and uh, have a good day.